Rose is in the very back. Everybody turn around and wave at Rose. Rose, we love you. Thank you. We're glad you're here. She is Patrick's better half. He always preaches better when she's here. So, Rose, thank you for being here. I've known Patrick for many years. Actually, I think more than a decade now. We've been friends for a long time. Uh, servants of the Lord together, as we all are. We're all priests of the Most High God together. Uh, but I want you to know a little bit about Patrick. Patrick is a servant of God. He's been a pastor for more than two decades. He's been a minister of the gospel for most of his life. Uh, he has been a minister who has actually served the poorest and the most needy people, which is rare. Most pastors want the big church with the big salary. Can we be honest about that? But Patrick has served people who nobody else wanted to serve. And I have always deeply respected that about Patrick. He looks out for the helpless and the weak and the needy, and he works to bless them in Jesus' name. May we all follow the example of Jesus doing that. Amen? But beyond that, Patrick has a heart for Jesus and his people that just never stops. And so as Patrick shares with us today, he's going to share with us an opportunity that we can join with him in to further the kingdom of God in a very powerful, very special way And I don't want to take any more time away from you, Patrick. Patrick, please come and bless us with what God has given you for us today. Love you. Yes. Moses has his rod. I got my mic. (laughs) All right. It's good to be with you. Pastor, what a joy it is to be with you. And by the way, so you know, Rose and I were with Pastor and Cheryl last night um, on your dime. Um, we, uh, we went out and we ate and we had a great time. And um, don't apologize for it either. Just want you to know. <laughs> Just want you to know we did that. And, and um, by the way, and then at dinner, we found out that your Pastor and Cheryl were celebrating on that day, which is last yesterday, the 28th. Wedding anniversary. Now, so Rose and I want to take them out to lunch today, but then I heard that uh, Sister Cheryl is going to host somebody, some ladies at the home. Well, what's to say you cannot crash? No, but we don't want, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. But, uh, but I, want, I tell you what, we will we'll stand and sing a happy anniversary song to them. And then, then I'm going to leave it to your creativity. Now, you know, I'm going to find out. I'm going to check about your creativity between today and the next few days and how, you, how you're, going to, um, you're going to um, congratulate them and, and, and celebrate their wedding anniversary. And they, they come, when wedding anniversaries comes once a year. You know, you know that, right? <laughs> uh, so let's stand together and let's sing happy anniversary to um, Pastor Steve and, and, and Cheryl, okay? Happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you. All right, you may be seated. They are wonderful, wonderful friends, and I'll tell you what, uh, like I told the folks uh, who, who were here at the earlier service, um, I, I find that in, 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 in ministry, uh, the, the way you the way you uh, you, you build you build the life in, in, into people is you you call them and you uh, you bless them and you pray for them and you find out how things are with them. Uh, and with your pastor, um, he's just one of a kind. Um, he's one who picks up the phone and checks in on me to see how I'm doing. And I tell you what, uh, he will never know how much I appreciate that. Uh, so, Steve and Cheryl, happy anniversary to both of you. And we'll, we'll catch you the next time we come up, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do lunch or dinner another time. Um, but that's not to say that you cannot do it, since we're going to be out of town, okay? Um, but anyhow, <clears throat> deeply appreciate the opportunity, Pastor. And yesterday, so you know, yesterday we did a planned giving seminar. Um, just want to take... Let me let me check let me check some some uh, check with you. Um, how many of you um, have a trust or will? Okay. How many of you do not have a trust or will? Okay. Those of you who do not have a trust or will, I am going to strongly recommend. When I say strongly recommend, I'm going to not only suggest. I'm going to strongly recommend that you see pastor after service. 
and you need to talk to one of the two attorneys who were here uh, yesterday with us um, and need to get that trust or will done as soon as you can. Along with, along with trust or will, you know, there's the living will business where toward the, the end of one's life, uh, you have to decide what you want to do with, with your own life and the life of your loved one. Um, now, you say, why in the world am I talking about this? Folk, very quickly, one out of one person die. Okay? That's, I mean, that's, that's a high percentage, right? Uh, um, and, and sooner or later, we're going to meet Jesus. Unless Jesus comes for us, okay, before then. Then that's fine, too. Um, but it's important that we plan it, and it's important that you include your church, Southside Community Church, in your trust. Amen? Now, say it with a little more conviction. Amen? Amen. Okay. It's real important, and here's why. Um, you've been blessed by being here. Now think about people who will come after you, after you, after you leave, and hopefully it'll be many, many years from now. The point is, you've got to think of your loved ones, uh, of, of people who come after you, of, of your neighbors, and, and others who do not know Jesus, but through the ministry of a pastor and Cheryl, and through the ministry of the leaders and members of this church here, others will come to know Christ. We've got to believe that. And then... Those folk get to, then you get to continue the, the, the legacy of, of their work, uh, of, of, of sharing the gospel, okay? So it's vitally important to include your church in your trust and your work. And, and here's why, it's another reason why it's important. Rose and I uh, uh, have a wonderful friend, in, uh, Dr. Warren Stewart, out of Phoenix, Arizona. He pastored the church for the last 37 years, straight out of seminary. He's now 62. You never know, looking at him, that he's 62. But the point is this. In 37 years of ministry there, he's not had one single family who has died and he's buried has ever included the church in the trust. Can you imagine that? Isn't that a tragedy? Um, you want to be able to include your, 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 your church and your trust. I know you want to include your family, but think about God's work. Okay? All right. Having said that, um, I want to thank your pastor for inviting me to come. And, and Rose and I are deeply grateful uh, for their friendship and their partnership in the gospel. And um, so this has been a wonderful weekend for us. And I want to thank the great God from Zion for his abiding friendship and his support. Um, and he'll, he'll, uh, he'll never know uh, what this means uh, to us. Um, however, I know that uh, our time here is limited this morning. And so I'll try to do what Elizabeth Taylor said to her seventh husband. <laughs> I will not keep you long. Okay, all right, all right. Anyway, if you would be so kind as to turn with me to the pages of Scripture, to John chapter 6. I'd like for us to read John chapter 6, and in honor of reading God's Word, I'd like for us to stand. John 6, and uh, please look at John 6. Uh, John is simply in the New Testament. Let's start right there. And it's the fourth book in the New Testament. And we'll go to John chapter 6. And let's read... Uh, the first 10 verses of John 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages will not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we come to you and ask that you make alive these black words on white pages and cause them to live again in the hearing and the listening and the speaking of your people today. And for that, we give you praise in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Please be seated. So the text tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 6, This Jesus said to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Everything begins, everything concrete 
begins with the word. So the Bible tells us in the beginning was the word. John 1 verse 1. And the word was uh, everything. Let's go to John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with he was in the beginning with uh, with God and all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of man similar thought with Genesis chapter 1 where the bible says in Genesis chapter 1 God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Don't let that profound thought run past us. When the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, let there be light, and there was light, in essence what it is is this. When God created the heavens and the earth, and He started with light, because without light there is no life, Amen. Now, guess how fast light goes? 186,000 miles per second. Now, think about that. How fast is that? Faster than anything you could ever think of. That's how God created the heavens and the earth. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this simply because you and I need to understand that everything concrete that God starts, He starts with the Word. He starts with the Word by saying, let there be light and there was light. When I look at you today, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that the God who brought this world into existence created you and me. Everything concrete begins with the word, God's word. Let there be light. And so the Bible tells us in John 1 and verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. full of grace and truth. So you know that I'm not dealing with somebody, something, some, some pie in the sky, by and by kind of deal. I want you to know that that word, that word who became flesh and dwelt among us 2,000 years ago still dwells amongst us. And he's concerned about who you are and where you are in what situation in life you're in today. And so he not only dwells with Pastor Rick Warren and his wife Kay today in the loss of their son. But he's concerned about you. He cares about you. He loves you. He loves you to the point that he, he, he sends his son. In, and more than that, he, he says that when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will be your comforter. Now the word comforter in the, um, in the New New. New Testament language in John 14 through John 16, the word comforter is the word paraclete. In the Greek, it simply means, it simply is the word parakaleo. And, and, and so, what in the world does that mean? That simply means he is one who walks alongside of us. God, the Holy Spirit, is one who walks alongside of you and walks alongside of me. You say, how important is that? That's very important. Why? He's not so, he's not... He's not one who is so impatient with us when he looks at us and he goes, you have been sitting here on this heap of whatever for a long time. It's time you get up off of the duff and start moving. No. If you choose to sit where you are for as long as you want to sit, he's going to sit with you. He is not impatient with you to run so far ahead of you that you can't catch up. He's not, he's not impatient with you where he kicks you behind the back and says, it's time to move on. No. God the Holy Spirit is one who holds our hands and walks alongside of us and yes, even sits with us and cries with us. And so I might be speaking to someone this morning who's been through one heck of a terrible week. And you come and you say now, what is this visiting preacher going to say to me today that makes any sense? And I hope that whatever I'm saying today will make some sense for you. Because ladies and gentlemen, this book makes more and more sense to me Every single day I walk with Jesus. Because Jesus Christ is not only, uh, um, every day with Jesus is not only sweeter than the day before. It is true. That is true. But every day with Jesus' word, God's word, is sweeter than the day before. Now, when I say sweeter, it does not mean I understand everything that God says to me today. 
But when I don't understand, it does not mean that God's word is not true. It just simply means that I need to grow. And God is going to help me grow. He's going to cause Romans 8, 28 to make more and more sense to me every single day. There are days I feel like the disciple uh, Philip, who, who when he faced, faced with the situation he faced with in, in John chapter 6, he goes, now Jesus, you want to feed all those people. Now how in the world are you going to feed them? You only got five loaves and two fish. Let me give you a suggestion. So Philip proceeds to give God a suggestion, Christ a suggestion. Listen, have you ever been, have you ever lived in such, as, as, to, to, to such a degree that you feel that sometimes you ought to give God a suggestion? Have you ever thought about giving God suggestions about how you ought to run the universe? Forget about running the universe. How about running your life? Have you ever thought if God didn't have your suggestion, why he might not make it through the day? Folk, perish that thought. God's lived without us, and he's doing fine. <laughs> okay? Um, so the text tells us, and then this text is important simply because this text this miracle of Jesus or the feeding of the 5,000, and by the way, that's a misnomer simply because there's more than 5,000 people he fed. Matthew 14 and verse 21 tells us because this miracle is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 14, 21 says, Jesus fed 5,000 men, comma, not counting women and children. But since women and children do count, amen? amen. There's more than 12 to 15,000 people there that day. That's different than 5,000. Amen? That's all like this. If I say you got $5,000, then I say you got really 12 to 15,000. Now, which is better? 12 to 15 is better than 5. You follow now. So now, 12 to 15,000 people being fed is more than 5,000 people being fed. So if you read the text in its entirety, you will understand it is not only the feeding of the 5,000, it is feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So when you add women and children in together, you're talking between 5, 12 to 15,000 people. So now when you come to a dilemma like this, and this is a big dilemma, ladies and gentlemen, if you have to try to feed 12 to 15,000 people and you've got five loaves and two fish, you've got a dilemma. You've got a major dilemma on your hands. And, and the, the thing I, I noticed in, 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 this, in this text is that there's a fellow named Andrew. Now, there's something about Andrew that, that really seriously amazes me because Andrew is, is uh, Simon Peter's younger brother. And, and Simon Peter has this younger brother, and, and every time he gets introduced, he gets introduced as in, in this way. In John 1 and verse 40, it goes, Andrew, comma, Simon Peter's brother. The only claim to fame Andrew had was the fact that he belonged to Simon Peter. Simon Peter's brother. How would you like to be introduced as Simon Peter's brother or somebody else's brother or sister? And yet that's exactly what, whenever somebody sees Andrew, he goes, there goes Simon Peter's brother. But there's something significant about Andrew that cannot be bypassed, and that is this. Every place you find Andrew, you find him, you find people, he's towing some, he's bringing some people along with him. He's bringing people to Jesus. Amen? Now let me ask you a question. How many of you got uh, family members like your father and mother uh, who don't know Jesus? How many of you got brothers and sisters who don't know Jesus? How many of you got relatives like uncles and aunts, cousins, relatives that don't know Jesus? Okay, now these questions were not just to ask to, to see if your hands work. They're simply asked to, to help you understand, to help us all of us understand today that we've got people within our own sphere of influence who do not know the Lord. And the only way that they can come to know Jesus in a real and personal way is that if we introduce them to Jesus. You with me? Now I'm not asking you to do something I'm not already done and want something that I'm, I continue to do, and that is this. My own father-in-law, Rose's father, came to know Christ after we talked with him and prayed with him for 30 years. It's kind of difficult whenever you have to talk to somebody and pray to somebody, a loved one, for 30 years over the phone. But that's how I led him to Christ over the phone. And where does he live? In Singapore. You say, how far away is that? If you sit on an airplane from Los Angeles all the way to Singapore, that's 19 hours. 
By the time you, you, you get up from sitting on the plane after 19 hours, your butts are sore. <laughs> I'm serious. Your legs are so sore you can hardly walk. And your, your, your legs are swollen. I mean, you know, understand what I'm talking about. You sit on an airplane long enough, your legs swell for some reason. My own brother-in-law, Ricky, just received the Lord a couple months ago over the phone. After 30 years of praying. So what I'm saying to you is don't give up. You got to keep praying every single day. You got to keep inviting. Invite your loved ones to come to church with you. You say, well, I invited them months ago and they haven't come. Invite them again. The next time I just do it. You follow? You got to invite. You say, but that's not my gift. You know what I think? And you're thinking this. Because how, how do I know? I've been pastor for 20 years. So I can tell you this. Here, here's what it is. Church folk think, the reason why I don't want to invite anybody to come to church is because pastor's got other gifts. I mean, that's why we call him to be our pastor. That's why we pay him. You don't pay him to do your work for you, by the way. You don't pay him to do witnessing for you. You got a witness. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, the Bible says. You say, but that's not my gift. That's, that's a pastor gift. God gives all the, the, the pastors all the gifts. No, he doesn't. Amen. Where is it written? Amen, pastor. Where, where is it? Where is it written that, that pastors get all the gifts? No. You find 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4. You never find pastors got all these gifts. They say, but I don't have the gift to witness. Witnessing is never classified as a gift. I'm suggesting to you, witnessing is not a gift. It is a command. It's an order. The order is not coming from me or your pastor or anybody else. It's coming from Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you say, that's not my gift. When I was growing up, my dad used to tell me, son, take out the garbage. Every time he sees me, he sees garbage. He says, son, take out the garbage. I never once said to my father, dad, that's not my gift. <laughs> He's gone, pow! And I would have said, I just got the gift. You follow? So it's nothing, it's nothing to do with spiritual gifts at all. Nothing at all. It is everything to do with obedience. Ladies and gentlemen, the longer I serve Jesus, the longer Rose and I walk with Jesus, the longer your pastor and Cheryl walk with Jesus, the more we are convinced that walking with Jesus every single day is a life of obedience. Nothing else. It's a life of obedience. And so, so the text simply tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 6, this he said to test him for himself knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to do. Now look very carefully at the text. He already knew. Okay? So he already knew. So what, what was all that about? Well, look at it again. How will we feed all those people? John 6 and verse 5 asks the question, How, Jesus, how will we feed all those people? There's all this 12 to 15,000 people to be fed. Jesus got a big problem that day, folks. Now, Understand this, when the Bible asks a question, when Jesus asks a question, and, and he asks a whole lot of questions in just the four Gospels along, and you check all of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, you find that God asks questions all the time. Now, when, when God asks a question, or in this particular case, when Jesus asks a question, he is not looking for information. Amen? <laughs> Jesus is not looking for information. And by the way, the last time we were here, I remember David Kwan and his wife Carol. My, your wife's name is Carol? Where is Carol? Where is Carol today? She's out in the, in the Sunday school? Okay. David and Carol took us out, uh, Rose and myself, and out to, uh, to, to dinner with uh, Scott and Sandy, if, I, if I'm, my memory serves me well. And, and um, we had a great time at a Chinese restaurant. By the way, it's not the best food you can find in Chinese restaurants. And wherever David leads you, you ought to go. Because he, he, he knows. Okay, He knows a lot of places. Anyhow, here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, now as you grow up in the life and ministry of this church, now I'm, I'm doing a little diversion, I'm coming back. When you grow up under the teaching and the preaching of your pastor, there will come a time, and, and, and Scott and Sandy didn't even have babies at that time yet. Now that baby Michaela's grown up now, okay? So now, now when you, you grow up in a life and ministry of, of, and preaching of a pastor, what happens is you ought to ask yourself the next question because things do change. Uh, um, because 
One time you were single, then you got married. After you got married, you got kids. Then you look around and you got other people who got other kids too. So you ask yourself the question, how do I pour myself into other people so that God's work can prosper in their lives too? Now that's the question. See, that I believe is the question. Amen, people? We've got to ask that question because if we don't ask that question, then it becomes a um, people pouring into your life all the time. It, there comes a point in time where you, people can continue to pour into you, but you can also pour into other people's lives. You follow? There is such a thing as receiving and giving at the same time. Just like the Sea of Galilee. It receives water, but it also gives out water. Does that make sense? So now when you look at the text, Jesus is trying to teach the disciples so that they in turn not only receive it, so that they in time can give it. Okay? So now you look. Jesus asks the question, how will we feed all those people? Now the question really is, what do you do when the clock is against you? And you don't have much time, and, and you, you've got to do something about it. Everything you read in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 6, everything's a liability. Look at them. The greatest liability of the 12 disciples. Outside of Andrew, who was looking for answers amongst the crowd, the other disciples were squabbling among themselves as to how Jesus can pull this off. When you and I walk a Christian life, when you and I live the Christian life, there will be times God tests us to the point where we do not know anything else other than drive God driving us to our knees and learning to depend upon Him. You believe that, say amen. amen. And until you come to a point where you depend on God and God alone to carry you through, you haven't lived life yet. And the sooner you come to that point where you learn to depend on God and God alone, the better off you and I will be. Because then you understand what living is all about, what Christian life is all about. The only asset in this text in John chapter 6 is that little boy. You say, why that little boy? Five loaves and two fish, folks. You read the text. Read the text. Five loaves and two fish. Andrew comes to Jesus and Andrew says, Lord, I, don't, I know you don't have much to work with, but at least this little boy got five loaves and two fish, and he's prepared to give it to you. Now, how many kids do you know who would give up their lunch? But this kid was willing to, and he gave up this lunch of five loaves and two fish. And then comes the question, question from Andrew. Andrew says, but what are they among so many? Even when Andrew, who went out to look for people, we got something that can place in the hands of Jesus, Andrew goes, Lord, I feel sorry for you because there's not enough. You see, you and, I got, you and I got this mentality that say, whatever we got is not enough. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I got to take what we don't have. We, you and I got to take our not enough, our quote unquote not enough, and we've got to put it, we've got to invest it into God's more than enough. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Our not enough is nothing in comparison to God's more than enough every single day of the week. And by the way, if you eat your seed, don't complain there is no harvest. You notice that little boy, if that little boy ate his own lunch that day, Andrew comes to him and Andrew goes, kid, I got news for you. You want to see a miracle? The kid says, I don't need a miracle. I got my lunch. <laughs> you can go figure out what you want to eat. I got my lunch. But that kid was willing to give up his lunch. And because that kid gave up his lunch, he had lunch and the crowd had lunch too. You follow? The kid did not eat his seed. He invested his seed in God's dream. I'm suggesting to you, I'm saying to you, you got to learn to invest your seed and plant the seed and sow your seed. Because if you eat your seed, do not complain, there is no harvest. Because it's a guarantee when you eat your seed, you will not have a harvest. And so, so, so Jesus comes along and Jesus gave thanks and the Bible simply tells us in three instances in the, in the book of John, in, in this Episode alone, John 6, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Three times 
The Bible simply tells us the people had as much as they wanted. They were filled. Twelve baskets were left over. He had to stress the point. The writer John stressed the point that by planting his seed into Jesus' dream, that boy saw that people had more than enough to eat. And he said it in three different ways. Sow seed into God's dream and reap a harvest. I stand before you, ladies and gentlemen, as a beneficiary of your mission work. In 1966, Carl and Louise Capon left the Wake, Wake Forest, North Carolina, and came out to Singapore by way of China. I was barely 12 years of age. And the only reason why I went to church was because some folks the pastor's wife said, if you come to Sunday school three Sundays, Sunday school and church three Sundays in a row, I'll give you a brand new Bible. If you did not send those missionaries and they gave me my first Bible, I'm confident I will not be standing before you today. But today I'm not asking you to do for me. I'm asking you to think about those 350 million people who do not have one word of the Bible in their own heart language as you and I worship here today. 350 million. That is slightly more than the population of the United States today. If you look at your bulletin, the back of your bulletin, please look at your back of your bulletin. There are presently 1,967 language groups of people which represent 350 million people who do not have one word of the Bible in their language. The next video clip, I'm, the, the video clip I want you to watch first is of the Gamo people in Ethiopia who, as a result of the work of the seed company, Bible Translators, they get a chance to view the gospel of Luke, the life of Jesus, on film for the very first time. And hear Jesus speaking in their heart language. Well, Ruth and I were asked to be a part of uh, starting the projector for the first showing of this Jesus film. Well, it was such an honor to be able to do that, just to know that there's people here who have never heard of Jesus and now they're going to get to see him and hear him talk in their own language. And that's the amazing part to me. I was just awestruck by the number of people that were present. Probably we would guesstimate about 4,500 people who came to the premiere and we were just blown away by the number. Certainly much more than I had ever anticipated. I was surprised at the crowd. I looked around and saw the multitude of people. It was incredible. For these people to see Jesus speak in their own Gamo tongue for the first time has got to be a great experience. <laughs> They responded because it was in their language and they were so emotional about it and it, it just touched up my heart as it did theirs. Boy, seeing the Jesus film here in this country is just mind-blowing. They were so focused, they hardly moved. 
Their eyes were just glued to the screen. It's just, it just takes your breath away to see the emotion that the people feel, but also the, the emotion that it brings out in my heart to see it for the first time in this environment. I thought, you know, God is really speaking to them. They're not watching a movie. They're having an experience with Jesus Christ. He's speaking to their hearts and they're responding. They were just moved. You could hear them groaning when things would happen. I just remember seeing some of the wailing and the, the children just sobbing and crying. And it just took my breath away. Just realizing what Jesus and the pain and the suffering that he did for us. Was it just a little too much to bear? And to see the response was truly unbelievable. To see that they, they wasted no time initially. Once the first gentleman stepped out, it's as though they all came. We were excited to see so many come, and most of them young men. That was exciting. That was encouraging. That was just beautiful. As I was sitting there, I realized that God had just led us to this in such a beautiful way that what is more of a blessing than seeing people come to the Lord, you know? <laughs> I, can, I cannot think of anything better. Try to visualize this. A lot of times we think what we do don't make a whole lot of difference. I've been pondering about it lately. You sent missionaries out to Singapore. Rose and I come to faith in Christ. God used us in ways, ways that we don't deserve and yet in ways to bless you back and show you what it is to take us to places around this country in over 650 churches, even as we speak. We've been in 650 churches across these United States. Hundreds upon hundreds have given their lives to Christ because of your investment. Think about the Gamal people who have never had the Word of God, one word of the Word of God in their hands. Got to view it for the very first time and hear the words of Jesus in their own heart language for the very first time. 1,967 language groups that do not have the Bible yet. And yet the seed company in the last 20 years, by April of 2014, would have completed 1,000 Bible translations, portions of 1,000 Bible translations in 20 years. Rose and I invite you to join us in this great commission effort. It's just fantastic to be able to take the Word of God, to be able to bless people so that they get a shot at at least one book of the Bible within the next 12 years. Within the next 12 years, we are claiming, the seed company is claiming, and we invite you to join us. 1,967 will become zero. They will at least have one book of the Bible, like the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John, in their own language. 
that is not only within the realm of possibility, that is going to happen. Because over the last 20 years already, a thousand Bible translations would have been completed by next year. And here's the thing. I just came from uh, a, a President's Forum, a President's Forum uh, from the, of the seed company. We call it a President's Forum, named after our president of our organization. And within a four-day thing, within a four-day retreat uh, in Georgia just uh, two weeks ago, five couples out of 100, 101 couples, five couples put on the table $7.2 million as matching funds. $7.2 million. In other words, everything beyond $2,500 $2, or more from an individual or church will be matched dollar for dollar. $2,500 becomes 5000 Folks, they, you don't get a double anything every single day. But when you get a chance to double. By the way, Pastor, a lady walked past and said that she's willing to put up new springs or a, do a project of, of listing the, the verses of the Bible, the verses of the Gospel of John. You say, now how do I get involved? That's a good question. And the answer is coming to you in this next video clip. So I've been asked to briefly explain our latest project here at Horizon. We've done some doozies in my day, and this one actually uh, is quite doable. Check this out. We're studying through the Gospel of John right now. We wrote this book and did a curriculum for our men's study and our women's study. All of our weekend services, midweek services, radio program, daily devotions. But as much as we love the book of John, here's what we realize. There are some people in the world who have never read it before. So with the help of some friends at the seed company, we located a little island off the coast of West Africa called Anabon. It's about the same size as our church. Here's the cool thing. In one weekend, our church sponsored all of the verses in the Gospel of John, $25 a verse. And here are all the boards outside in our courtyard of people that got to sign their name and say, that's my verse. And with my help and, uh, and, and, and God's help, we're going to translate this into the Adamanese language. But guess what? It didn't stop there. Uh, we were so blown away at the response of our church that now we've taken on a second language just at the base of the Himalayas. We've called it Roba because, well, now where we're taking the Gospel of John, it's illegal to go there. And most Christians uh, that have ever been killed on the planet have been killed in that region. In fact, it's called the graveyard of missionaries. They need the Gospel of John as well. They've never read it before. So how could we be studying it again and falling even deeper in love with the book that we know so well when there are people who have never read it before? My challenge to you is as a church, you could find a region, you could find a tribal dialect that's never read the Bible and maybe break it down because here's the truth. People aren't gonna miss out on heaven because they didn't read the book of Leviticus. They're gonna miss out on heaven because they didn't meet Jesus. So you take a book like John you bring it before your congregation. You get the verses sponsored with the help of an outfit like Issachar or the seed company, and bam, we can get this job done in record time. In fact, we've got blank walls around the campus that I'm hoping in the next couple months, we wouldn't stop with just Anabon and Roba. We'd find a third language group. We'd find a fourth language group. And together, if you joined arms with us, if we did this together, we could accomplish the reason why we're here, and that's to go into all the world and share the gospel. So if I'm talking to you right now and you're a pastor, let's do this. I'm praying you take the lead, have courage, believe in God's ability to do more through you than you think could ever happen, because in one weekend we had all this done, and in the next weekend we had all of Roba done, and boy, just think if all of the churches rallied together, we could get this done. Now, if you're not the pastor, would you pray for your pastor? Because without vision, people perish. God bless you. By the way, your pastor and Cheryl have been supporting the Wycliffe work for what, 20 some years now? 28 years. You get to join them. I'm asking you to adopt a language group in Asia. If you take the number from Asia and the Pacific Islands, that's over a thousand. Very soon, Rose and I will be sent back to Singapore to begin to, to plan a beachhead for the work in Asia. There are over 100 million people in China alone that do not have one word of the Bible in their language. 100 million. 
So I'm encouraging you to adopt a language group in Asia. Remember to sow seed into God's dream and reap a harvest. I close with this. Eugene Butler was the music director for the state of Oklahoma years ago, and one of the songs that Eugene Butler's father wrote is one of my favorite songs, simply called Victory in Jesus. Shortly after Eugene Butler's father wrote the song, he died, and Eugene Butler's mother became very sick and lay in a comatose state there in the Fort Smith, Arkansas Hospital. For three weeks, Mrs. Butler was not able to open her eyes nor speak a word, but somehow... The children thought the mother wanted to see Eugene Jr. and so they called for Eugene Jr. to come to the mother's bedside. Eugene Jr. was in Oklahoma City and so he came to the mother's bedside, walked into the hospital room. His little frail mother had not spoken a word nor raised an eyelid in three weeks. He went in, raised up the oxygen tent, put his hand on her wrist and says, Mama, Mama, this is Eugene Jr. Mama, is there something you want to tell me? Well, this lady had not spoken a word in three weeks. But then she raised her hands, opened her eyes to full measure. Eugene Jr. Take, took the oxygen tent and removed it and lifted it above her head. She raised herself on her elbows, lifted the silver hair from her pillow, and she began to sing. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard of His groaning, of His precious blood's atoning. And then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. And then she fell back on a pillow and went to claim a victory that was hers in Jesus Christ. Days later, someone said to Eugene Jr., Gene, isn't it a shame your mother wasn't able to finish the song your daddy wrote? But Eugene Jr. said, oh, she did. She and daddy made it a duet in glory. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, is this. There is a great there is a grand and there is a glorious hour coming when we shall stand in the throne room of our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And Rose and I will be there. Pastor Steve and Cheryl will be there. And all of you will be there who have claimed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And also present will be millions of people in these language groups that we see today. And they will be there and Jesus will introduce us to our friends, to our brothers and sisters. And he'll say, I want you to know that these folks are here because you invested in them in making sure that they got my word. And because they got my word, they got to know me personally. And they got to receive me as their Lord and their Savior. And there in heaven, we will get to sing a duet in glory. I thank you very much. Pastor, turn time over to you.